Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 14th July 2019. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Thiruvananthapuram editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also given in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article analysis. This news article is about the Indian assistance to Myanmar government with respect to the issue of alleged ethnic cleansing and persecution of Rohingyas. The discussion can be linked to the areas of prelims and main syllabus which has been highlighted here. To understand the news article, let us know in brief about Rohingyas in Myanmar. Firstly, Rohingyas are an ethnic Muslim minority. It is estimated that around 35 lakh Rohingyas are dispersed worldwide. And before August 2017, 10 lakh Rohingyas resided in the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Moreover, Rohingyas differ ethnically, linguistically and religiously from Myanmar's dominant Buddhist groups. If we see, historically the Rohingyas have been persecuted or oppressed and they are still being oppressed in Myanmar. It is said that the Rohingyas have been in Myanmar since 8th century AD. However, they are subjected to repeated persecution in Myanmar, particularly since 1940s after the independence of Myanmar. Now, let us see few instances where they were left out in the national events of Myanmar. In 1982, a new law for citizenship was passed in Myanmar. This law identified around 135 national ethnic groups, but this law made Rohingyas stateless because it did not identify or recognize Rohingyas as one of the national ethnic groups who are eligible for citizenship. Then in 2014, Myanmar has conducted its census after a gap of more than 25 years. But the census also excluded the counting, registration and the inclusion of Rohingyas. Next, in November 2015, the first democratic elections happened in Myanmar after a military rule. In this also, the Rohingyas were not allowed to participate even as voters or as candidates. So, they were excluded from the democratic nation-building process of Myanmar. Then, since 2016, the persecution faced by the Rohingyas at the hand of Myanmar government has become unbearable. And the news article has said that around 7 lakh Rohingyas have fled from Myanmar to the camps in Bangladesh. Rohingyas are alleging that an ethnic cleansing of Rohingyas is being carried out by the Myanmar's security forces. One of the names of the camps in Bangladesh is mentioned in the newspaper. That is the Kutupalong camp in Bangladesh. In this Kutupalong camp, there are nearly 10 lakh Rohingyas, including about 400 Hindu families who are now living in precarious or extremely sorrowful conditions. Their condition has become much worse due to monsoon rainfall and the flooding in the camps in Bangladesh. Then in August 2017, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army attacked several Myanmar police posts. After this incident, the Myanmar government had a crackdown or strict action in the areas where Rohingyas are settled. As a result of this violence, several thousands of Rohingyas left Myanmar. The Myanmar government is saying that the Rohingyas are doing terrorist activities and are also creating insurgency in the country. In 2016, the Indian Prime Minister has told that India will actively cooperate to combat the common challenges of terrorism and insurgent activity in the region. So, as a result of the above violence, few of the Rohingyas have also fled to our country. And we have seen in newspapers that India has been taking steps, deport them back to Myanmar. On May 21st, 2019, uh, we have analyzed an editorial article which is titled as Moral Ambiguity on the Rohingya. In that analysis, we have said that India is providing Myanmar with uh, $25 million for development projects including prefabricated houses in Rakhine state. And today's news article is a news about an action which is related to those humanitarian development projects in the Rakhine state. This news article says that India has built around 250 prefabricated homes in Myanmar 
to rehabilitate the Rohingyas. Pre-fabricated homes are built by assembling and integrating the already fabricated wooden or concrete or other panels. It is said that such homes are cheaper and it takes very less time as compared to the conventional method of construction. The understanding of this action is that when Rohingyas return to Myanmar, they can use those homes. And these homes are designed to survive quakes and cyclonic storms also. This is a form of friendly gesture to the Myanmar government and it also acts as a creative incentive for Rohingyas to return home. These prefabricated homes are developed in three clusters which are situated in three areas. These areas are Shwezar, Kainchon Tong and Nantar Tong. But it is said that these areas have witnessed worst incidents of violence including mass murder, gang rape of women and children and the burning of thousands of homes. Next, the assistance given by India is a part of an agreement between India and Myanmar which was signed in 2017. This agreement deals with the enabling provisions for the return of Rohingyas to Myanmar and the socio-economic development of the Rakhine state of Myanmar also. Under the agreement, India has committed to spend $25 million, that is almost around 170 crore rupees for Rakhine State Development Program for over a period of five years. This Rakhine State is in the southwestern part of Myanmar and the project for prefabricated house cost around 10 crore rupees. Then, Myanmar has also requested India to fund construction of small villages, culverts and school buildings as a part of the bilateral agreement. Here, culvert is a tunnel or a sewer line that carries a water stream under a road or railway. It sometimes also acts as a bridge for traffic movements also. Below the bridge, if you see, you will find the pipe carrying the water stream. Then, China, Japan and some ASEAN member countries have also extended similar support to Myanmar. That is, China has also given around 100 prefabricated houses in January 2018 for rehabilitating the dis displaced persons in Myanmar. But the experts are saying that the government of Myanmar is refusing to recognize Rohingyas as citizens. They are also not going to prosecute and punish the military personnel and civilians for the sexual assaults, rape and killings and the burning of the houses of the Rohingyas. In such a situation, the Rohingyas will not return back to Myanmar. And in such a situation, these uh, prefabricated homes will be in unused condition and the targeted use of these homes will not be fulfilled. This is because firstly, trust has to be built among the Rohingyas. The trust here means that the Rohingyas should believe that they will get justice citizenship rights, land and other rights if they return to Myanmar. Then only they may go to their own country. Therefore, building trust is more important than building homes. We should note that the United Nations has also called the persecution that has happened to Rohingyas in Myanmar as a classic example of genocide. Genocide in this context means the mass killing of Rohingyas ethnic minority population in the Myanmar country. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. The displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next discussion, which is about the space observatory, which has been launched by Russia. This discussion can be linked to the areas of prelims and main syllabus, which has been highlighted here. Russia has launched a space observatory on Saturday from the Cosmodrome. That is the space launch facility of Russia, which is located at Baikonur in Kazakhstan. A space observatory is any instrument in outer space which is used for observation of distant planets, galaxies and other outer space objects. This space observatory has been named as Spectre RG Space Observatory. Russia has jointly developed this space observatory with Germany. The Spectre RG Observatory has been designed to capture X-ray image of faraway objects in the universe. So, it would observe the black holes, neutron stars and magnetic fields of the universe. Along with this, a telescope will also be used to help in completing the map of the world. This space observatory will replace the Spectre R. The Russian state space agency, which is Roscosmos, has said that it had lost control of Spectre R in January 2019. If you see, this Spectre R is also called as Russian Hubble. Spectre R was launched in the year 2011 
to observe black holes, neutron stars and magnetic fields. Now in this Spectre RG Space Observatory, there are two telescopes. They are E Rosita Telescope and Art XC Telescope. Both these telescopes will help in detecting the sources of X-ray radiation throughout the universe. Now we can see many celestial bodies of the universe from the te telescopes that are already present in the earth. So you can think what is the reason behind to have a space telescope. This is because the light from the space cannot reach completely to the earth's surface due to distortion. Distortion means bending or curving. This happens because the air in the earth's atmosphere keeps moving. This is the reason why we can see the stars twinkling in the sky. The earth's atmosphere also blocks some wavelengths of light partially or completely. If you see particularly it blocks the ultraviolet light. Hence it is not possible for us to see anything present in the universe very clearly. So this makes space the only place where a telescope can get a truly clear and comprehensive view of the universe. This is the reason why major countries of the world have launched space telescopes or have set up their own space observatories in this space. The Russian Space Observatory which contains two space telescopes that we saw now has a specialized focus. It will detect only the sources of X-ray radiation. But there are also space observatories that have telescopes for various purposes that is to detect various wavelengths of lights such as infrared rays or gamma rays in the universe. Some of the other famous telescopes are Hubble Space Telescope which is launched by NASA and Astrosat which is launched by ISRO. That, with this we have come to the end of this article analysis. The respect practice question will be discussed in the last session. This news article is about the second informal summit between India and China. The relevant areas under which the discussion can be linked to the prelim syllabus and main syllabus has been highlighted here. The news article states that the Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi are going to have their second informal summit. This is set to happen at Varanasi in India on October 12th. The first informal summit was held last year on April 2018 at Wuhan city in China. At the Wuhan summit, the Chinese president accepted the invitation of Indian Prime Minister to visit India for the next informal summit. So that is what is going to happen on October 12th. Now you may think, what is this informal summit? For this, we should first understand what is a formal summit. Formal summits involve a long period of or many months of minute diplomatic planning. In the formal summit, there is an agenda for discussion. And even the topics to be avoided during the discussions are important. Now, if we look at uh, informal summits, informal summits lack the ceremony, it lacks protocol and even it lacks ceremony of formal ones such as there are no delegation level talks and there is no preset agenda for discussions. In an informal summit, agreements are not signed and there is no joint statement or press conference. So, in an informal summit, the two leaders who are involved just hold one-to-one -one discussions. Now it is said that the second informal summit between India and China is a part of a fresh drive to energize ties between the countries. This is happening after the last month meeting of the Indian Prime Minister and Chinese President in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan which happened on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. Also a Chinese official has noted that the decision to hold the second informal summit is in line with Beijing's decision to celebrate the 70th anniversary of China's diplomatic relations with India. So remember that this year that is 2019 is the 70th anniversary of China's diplomatic relations with India. The official also noted that India and China are ancient civilizational states and they will be the pillars of the multipolar world. During the Wuhan uh, informal summit last year, the two leaders spent nine hours together in seven events, which included four one-on-one -on -one meetings, boat ride, museum tour, etc. So in the same lines, it is expected that in the second informal summit, there will be a boat ride by the two leaders on the Ganga River. In addition to the second informal summit, the external affairs minister of India is expected to visit Beijing next month. This will be the second meeting of the India and China high level 
people to people exchanges mechanism whenever we say people to people it means interaction between the normal citizens of two countries at various levels without any official interference and guidance for such interactions the people obviously have to obtain proper visas and travel documents but at this stage the state's role will end such interactions can be through professional bodies like the bar councils or traders chambers and associations industrialists groups educational institutions and artists musicians singers film personalities sportsmen and women etc even free exchange of books publications and newspapers then television programs would also fall in the ambit of people to people contacts this is because of their impact on opinion making and improving relations so the focus of the visit of external affairs minister is on people to people exchanges and culture then all the topics of bilateral ties will also be discussed it includes the detailing of the varanasi informal summit also but the topic on trade and commerce will not be covered in this meeting with this we have come to the end of this analysis this news article is about chandrayaan 2 we have been frequently telling you that we will be seeing many news articles on chandrayaan for the next one week or so we have discussed many important information and facts in yesterday's and other previous sessions of our news analysis so today let us see only the new and other important aspects that have not been covered so far this discussion can be linked to the areas of prelims and main syllabus which has been highlighted here firstly know that chandrayaan 2 will be the first mission to reach and study the south pole of the moon we have been seeing that it consists of a orbiter which orbits the moon next the lander and the rover module once the entire spacecraft enters into the moon's orbit the lander and the rover module will separate as a single unit from the orbiter after separating both the lander and the rover will soft land on the moon it will land at 70 degrees to the south latitude of the moon if you see in chandrayaan 1 mission the moon impact probe was detached from the orbiting chandrayaan 1 spacecraft then it hard landed on a designated spot on the moon so this is one of the difference which you need to know if chandrayaan 2 is successfully soft lands on the moon then india will become the fourth country in the world to have soft landed on the moon after usa then the former soviet union which is now the russian federation without certain countries which were present in the union and then china if you see totally 38 attempts have been made so far to soft land on the moon but according to isro the success rate is only 52% so we need to wait and see if india will be successful in soft landing on the moon or not the next thing which you need to know is from where the lander and the rover will get its energy to work isro has designed both the lander and the rover to work based on solar energy you can see in the picture given here there is a solar panel which is fixed to the sides of the lander and the solar panel is fixed to the side panel of the rover so we can see that both the modules will get energy from the sun now know that the time taken for the moon to complete one rotation on its axis is approximately equal to 29.5 earth days the moon's surface experiences daylight for about half of these 29.5 earth days half of this 29.5 days is roughly more than 14 days next this 29.5 earth days that is the time which takes uh, for the moon to complete one rotation is equal to the time the moon takes to complete one orbit around this this is the reason why we can see the same side of the moon always facing the earth now we know that every point on the moon's surface will have only 14 days of light approximately and we also know that both the lander and rover would be powered by solar energy that is based on the light from the sun so whatever experiments the scientists have planned to do they should complete this within these 14 days once the night occurs in the moon the temperature in the moon's environment will be minus 180 degrees celsius and our lander and rover have not been designed to survive this extreme cold so they might not work once the next moon day occurs next let us see about the orbiter and how the orbiter will capture the images of the moon we saw that once the spacecraft enters the moon's orbit 
the lander and the rover module would detach from the orbiter. So, it is clear that orbiter is going to stay in the moon's orbit that is above the moon's surface. The orbiter will capture the images of the moon from a 100 kilometer lunar polar orbit. This indicates that the orbiter will be in an orbit which is 100 kilometer on the top of the moon's surface and especially near the moon's pole. When the moon rotates about its axis, in east-west direction, the lunar polar orbit will be in the north-south direction in a perpendicular way. So, if the orbiter is positioned in this lunar polar orbit, it would be able to take the entire image of the moon. Finally, let us see about the payload that each of these three modules have, that is the orbiter, lander and the rover. The word payload have different meanings in different work areas. In space missions, the payloads refer to the scientific instruments which the spacecrafts carry. Now, it is not possible to remember the payload's name, but just to try to know the purpose of using a particular payload in the mission. First, let us see the payload of orbiter. We saw that the main purpose of orbiter is to capture the images of the moon from the lunar orbit. So, camera can be one possible payload used in the mission. If you see, the name of this payload is terrain mapping camera 2. Like this, there are seven more payloads in the orbiter to study about the moon's atmosphere. Next, let us see the purpose of using the payload in the lander. One of the payloads is named as CHASTE. It will measure the vertical temperature gradient and the thermal conductivity of the lunar surface. Temperature gradient means the changes in the temperature and the thermal conductivity of the lunar surface means to how much extent the lunar surface conducts the heat. Here the full form of CHASTE is Chandra's Surface Temperature Thermophysical Experiment. Then there is one more payload to detect the lunar quakes. This is called as ILSA or the Instrument of Lunar Seismic Activity. Next let us see some of the payloads used in rover. The first one is APXS that is Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer. The rover will come out of the lander once the module soft lands on the moon. After that, the samples will be analyzed by this APXS payload to determine the elemental composition of the lunar surface, which is nothing but knowing the different elements that are present on the surface of the moon. With this, we have come to the end of this news article discussion. The display practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next discussion, which is on sovereign bonds. There are two news articles today on sovereign bonds. One news article is about what is meant by sovereign bonds. The next news article is about the comments made by the former Union Finance Minister, Mr. Rashwan Sinha on these sovereign bonds. The relevant areas under which the discussion can be linked to the prelim syllabus and main syllabus has been highlighted here. First, let us see what is meant by the sovereign bond. This sovereign bond is also called as government bond. These sovereign bonds are debt instruments, meaning if the government wants money, then it will issue bonds to those who give money. The bond given by the government is basically to assure that the interest would be paid on a periodic basis. And also the entire face value, that is the actual value which was mentioned while getting the debt would be repaid by the government. Now, if you see, this is one of the ways the government is able to raise money from the market. Indian government has usually issued sovereign bonds only within India. But in the recent general budget for the financial year 2019-20, to the Union Finance Minister has said that India's sovereign external debt to GDP is among the lowest globally, which is less than 5%. She has said that government would start to borrow money from external markets and that too in external currencies. Here, external markets mean markets which are located outside India and the money that the government borrows will also be in form of external currencies, that is any currency apart from the Indian rupee. It can be in the form of US dollars or in the form of Euro or British pounds, etc. And the term domestic markets means markets which are located within India. The finance minister also said that the borrowing money from external markets will help to create a demand for government bonds in the domestic market. So, if the government starts issuing more sovereign bonds outside India, the sovereign bonds issued within India, that is in the domestic market, will come down. 
Now, whoever wants to invest in government bonds will have to wait. This is what we call as a demand. Now, some market analysts are telling that the money which the government will get from the external markets by issuing sovereign bonds will be near 10 billion US dollars, which is approximately 70,000 crore rupees. If the exchange rate of 1 US dollar is 70 rupees and this 70,000 crore rupees will be 10% of the total market borrowings of the government. So, the sovereign bonds that are issued by Indian government in the external market can also be called as overseas bonds. Now, let us see what benefit India is likely to get by issuing these overseas bonds. The government's argument is that if it continuously issues sovereign bonds, it means that all the domestic savings are invested in the sovereign bonds. So, there is no money left to be invested in the private sector. The private sector growth is equally important for the economy. So, if it is not having adequate money, then it cannot invest in its projects. So, in order to increase the private sector investments, the government is arguing that it will issue overseas bonds. According to Finance Secretary of Government of India, out of the total domestic savings, the government borrowing accounts to about 80 to 85 percent. So, we can see uh, that the private sector is not getting enough investments. Therefore, borrowing from external market will help the government to raise funds in such a way that there is enough money available in the domestic market for the private sector. We might get to know the global demand for the Indian sovereign bonds that is the overseas bonds once only when it is introduced by India. Now, let us see the risks that are associated with issuing these overseas bonds. The first problem is that India's repayment of debts which it would get from the overseas bonds because we saw that it will raise the overseas bonds in foreign currencies. Assume that today India has a currency exchange rate 70 rupees for 1 US dollar. It means that 1 US dollars is equal to 70 Indian rupees. Now, tomorrow if the currency exchange rate becomes 71 rupees, then we say that the rupee is depreciating. And if the currency exchange rate becomes 69 rupees, we say that the rupee is appreciating. Now, if the rupee is appreciating, it means the money which we will be repaying to the external market when the bonds get matured will be less. But if rupee depreciates, then we have to repay more money. Now, there are a lot of factors which determines the exchange value of the rupee. Just remember the concept of appreciation and depreciation as of now. This news article says that India's currency is stable or less risky when compared to other countries. We saw that one factor for measuring stability is with the help of knowing the trend of exchange rates. The news article mentions that India is not likely to be viewed as a risky country by the international market. So, India is likely to fetch an attractive rate for the overseas bonds. The news article also cautions that once the funds are easily and cheaply available, the government must not think of borrowing heavily from overseas markets. Because in 1970s, some countries like Mexico and Brazil borrowed heavily from the overseas markets. And once the currencies of these countries depreciated heavily, they were not able to repay their debts. This is because, as we saw earlier, if the currency depreciates, then the value becomes higher. So, it will be difficult to repay the debt. The next risk for India by these overseas bonds is that the foreign exchange reserves will increase very fastly. If the foreign exchange reserves are more, then the rupee will start to appreciate more. That means the exchange rate values will start decreasing. Now, if the exchange rate starts decreasing, then the imports will start to increase since the importers will have more money now. For example, today the exchange rate is 70 rupees for 1 US dollars. Tomorrow it appreciated to 60 rupees. Assume that you are an importer who is importing goods from US which is worth 10 dollars. You have 10 dollars in hand which will be equal to 700 rupees. At today's exchange rate, you have to spend at least $10 to buy that good. But tomorrow when the rupee appreciates, you just need 600 rupees to buy that good. And you will have extra 100 rupees in your hand and you will think of buying new good. This is the reason why the news article is saying that the imports will start to increase. But here, our focus should be on exports. 
because if uh, the rupee starts appreciating then the exchange rate for whatever goods and services that we are exporting will be less it will end in affecting the imports and exports so raising overseas bonds will ultimately encourage imports rather than exports always remember that only exports will give money to any country rather than imports so if exports have to be encouraged then the overseas bonds should not be issued the next issue is regarding the difference between the issuing sovereign bonds in domestic markets and issuing sovereign bonds in overseas markets if the government is not able to repay the money that is raised by issuing these sovereign bonds then the government will simply print some extra indian currency and repay the debt but it is not possible for india to print a foreign currency if india is not able to repay the debt received in the form of foreign currency so this is one more problem here we can see that though the overseas bonds will help to boost the private sector investments the overall risks for the indian economy are more the same thing has been said by former finance minister mr yashwant sinha he has explained that there are three types of external borrowing one is the indian private sector and the public sector borrowings from uh, abroad the second one is the resurgent india and millennium development bonds which is issued by state bank of india so through this the foreign money came directly into india's banking system instead of the government therefore it reduced the risks in handling the money by the government also know that these two were not sovereign bonds and the third type is the sovereign bonds these are the bonds issued by any national governments in its name the former minister has said that india has never raised money through sovereign bonds since 1947 for some very solid reasons because india would be affected by any changes that happened in the global market like the ongoing us china trade war from both these news articles just try to know the concept of overseas bonds their benefits and risks as per the news article the interest rates maturity period and other details of these overseas bonds would be released in september so we shall discuss more about these overseas bonds at that time with this we have come to the end of this discussion the split practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session let us see the first question the first question states in which of the following country thousands of people belonging to the rohingya community have fled their country due to ethnic cleansing and genocide now according to international criminal court genocide means any of the act uh, committed with an intent to destroy a nation ethnic group or racial group or a religious group by the acts of killing the members of the group or by causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group or deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of uh, life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part or by imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group or by forcibly transferring children of the group to another group now in this our today's concern is about killing members of the group so when we say when we say genocide is killing the members of a group of a particular group we may think the option is option b sri lanka because she in sri lanka also there was a genocide which happened but it was against the tamil community it was not against the rohingya community this genocide and ethnic cleansing of rohingya community happened in the country myanmar and they have fled to other countries other nearby countries to bangladesh india malaysia etc so here the correct answer is myanmar now if you look at the second question it is based on chandrayaan 2 two statements have been given we have to choose the correct statement the first statement states the purpose of the orbiter and the second statement states the purpose of the rover of chandrayaan 2 The first statement states the orbiter will analyze the composition of the elemental samples that are collected from the lunar surface. But during our discussion we discussed that the orbiter will capture the images of the moon from the lunar orbit and uh, various payloads in the orbiter will study the lunar atmosphere. We did not see that the orbiter will analyze the composition of the elemental samples. So this statement is wrong. Now based on this you can say that statement 2 is also wrong. because just now we saw that various payloads in the orbiter will study the lunar atmosphere so obviously the main purpose of rover is not to study the lunar atmosphere 
but the purpose of the rover is to analyze the composition of the elemental samples that are collected from the lunar atmosphere. So, this makes statement 1 and 2 as the incorrect statement. So, the final answer to this question is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now, if you look at the next question, it is based on sovereign bonds. Four statements have been given. We have to choose the wrong statement with respect to the sovereign bonds. Now, if you see the first option which has been given, it states sovereign bond is a debt instrument issued by the government. This is correct. Yes, it is a debt instrument that is issued by the government. The bond given by the government is basically to assure that the interests would be paid back on a periodic basis. And also the entire face value that is the actual value mentioned while getting the debt would be repaid by the government. So, this makes the second statement as also the correct statement. Now, the third option given here is they can be issued even outside a particular country. Now, this statement is also correct because our today's discussion was based on issuing sovereign bonds in the external market only. So, obviously, it means that it can be issued even outside a particular country. So, third statement is also correct which makes our fourth statement as the wrong statement and it is the correct answer to this question which states foreign exchange reserves of a particular country will reduce if the sovereign bonds are issued in external markets. Now, this statement is wrong because the foreign exchange reserves of a particular country will increase if the sovereign bonds are issued in external markets because the government receives the foreign money in foreign currencies. So, this would naturally increase the foreign exchange reserves of India. So, the correct answer is option D. Now, this next question is based on a space telescope or space observatory. The question asks which of the following is not a space telescope or space observatory. Now, three options have been given. One is Specter RG, second is Hubble, third is AstroSat. Now, we have one discussion based on space telescope or space observatory today. Space telescope belonged to Russia and it was named Specter RG. So, this means that it is a space telescope. So, that cannot be in our final answer. So, we can eliminate option A and option C because option C is given as all the above is not a space telescope. So, we can eliminate that option also. Now, either option B is correct or option D is correct. Now, we saw that AstroSat is launched by India by the Indian Space Research Organization that is by ISRO and know that it is a space telescope. You may not remember about Hubble telescope, but it is also a space telescope. So, you can easily, you know, eliminate option B because option 3, we have already said it is a space telescope, which makes option B as incorrect. So, the correct answer to this question is option D, none. With this, we have come to the end of our all our sessions. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankara IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation.